Welcome to the March meeting of the Manhattan Libertarian Party. Our speakers for tonight are Kinsey Casey from netcompetition.org and Paul Guerin from freethe.net. Um, take it away. Well, thank you guys for having us tonight. This is <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Net neutrality is an issue that I think a lot of people have probably heard the word but don't know really what it means. Um, and it is a very complicated and technical issue. And I can't say that I am, you know, well versed on everything about how the internet works. And, you know, I, I can reset my cable box in my apartment when my internet goes down, but I am not necessarily a technical person. I am here to talk about sort of the issue and the debate around net neutrality. Um, and as, if you'll notice, uh, my organization is called Net Competition uh, because you will sort of hear that net neutrality kind of, I guess, honed the messaging and they sort of won the messaging debate about this, uh, mostly because there's nothing neutral about net neutrality. I mean, it's, there's nothing neutral about the government sort of di dictating one way to design networks. There's nothing neutral about it. So the other side sort of won the messaging debate on this, but let me just briefly sort of explain what net neutrality is, what it means, and where we go from here. Uh, first of all, uh, it's basically a debate over the direction of the internet. Uh, and we advocate, our net, net competition advocates for continuing a free market internet sort of opposed to socialized internet. Uh, net neutrality advocates basically for activist regulation of broadband prices and terms and conditions. Um, so we thought we, the, the Manhattan Libertarian Party might be interested in this debate <laughs> uh, because net neutrality basically wants to regulate the internet and they want government control. So let me explain it. It's more, I think it's easier, and you might agree with me, Paul, that it's easier to explain it in example rather than sort of the technical details of it. Yeah. Um, so we could use New York as an example, but New York also has the most wireless spots, I think, in the country. And if you know, you could basically log onto your computer and find some sort of wireless spot, and if somebody hasn't password protected it, you could probably get on the internet. So it's probably better to use rural America as our example. Uh, because in rural America, granted, we've made huge uh, leaps and bounds in the last eight years since the inception of broadband, but not everywhere in the country has broadband. I think now it's about 96% of uh, two zip codes have broadband service. So almost everybody does. But in rural America, it's a little bit more difficult. You have a couple of choices. You can have satellite, which is almost prohibitively expensive in certain areas, um, up towards of $100 a month which is sort of amazing since I think my cable bill is something somewhere around $19 a month. Um, and then it sort of goes into a progression. You can pay, you know, $5.95 for dial-up access, and you can pay $10.95 for sort of a premium dial-up access. You can pay $14.95 for broadband, um, which is amazing. My parents, in fact, still have dial-up, and uh, dial-up and broadband are at the exact same price. <laughs> so we're trying to move them forward a little bit. They live in Montana, you know. Uh, so essentially, the internet already has a tiered system. Um, and consumers, as consumers, we choose what price we pay for what service levels. So there's basically, you know, rural America doesn't want Sprint or Verizon or AT&T for that matter or anyone else that's providing their service uh, telling them that they can't look at a Google page because they haven't paid for the highest level of service. And I, I can pick on Google later. But, you know, we don't want people telling us what we can and cannot look at because we've only paid a certain amount of money. And also, as I'm sure you're all very well aware, dial-up is a lot slower, <laughs> much slower. And it takes a lot longer, and videos sometimes you can't even get because the connection times out. So essentially, that's the way that it works. It's a tiered system. Um, so it doesn't make sense uh, to not expect sort of the net giants like Google or Amazon or Yahoo to not have the same system. I mean, it makes complete sense to have them paying, the same, paying into the same system as we are as consumers. Um, so essentially, there's a tiered system that they use as well. I mean, their Google, Amazon, Yahoo, those companies, their business model is basically based on free. They don't need to lay the inter infrastructure, they don't have to lay the cable to, to make their business operate. And the way that they make money is off of advertising, which is also a tiered system. Because if you think about it, it's sort of common industry practice for search engines to give preferential treatment to websites or sponsored links. Those are the people that are actually paying money to have their, their link advertised. Uh, and that's, that's industry standard. And it's also competition. That's how it works. Um, so really, 
the, the odd thing about net neutrality is that there's no, I mean, at this point, there's no issue. Uh, we, we believe in the status quo, we believe in keeping everything the way it is. Net neutrality would actually seek to regulate, uh, which is not what we're looking to do. And the response from the, the net neutrality folks has been very heavy-handed given that we don't see that there's really actually a problem. <laughs> um, and essentially, I don't know if that example sort of showed you or gave you a better idea of what net neutrality is seeking to do. But it is, essentially, it discourages investment in sort of any competitive alternative broadband facilities and underma undermines uh, facilities-based competition. It essentially, for the most part, it stifles competition and innovation, we believe. Um, the core of the debate, I think, is really who is better at facilitating this issue, whether it's the government or whether it's the free market. If you specified the issue, if I may request, do I have it right? Someplace in there, the government will come in and cause somebody like Google to pay a higher price for the web than me or you. Or if that's not it, what is it? Because well, I didn't get it. In there for sure, go ahead. Hi. Um, first of all, thanks uh, for having us here. And Kinsey, thanks for the excellent uh, background on that. Um, to address your question, but also to develop a greater context, what we're talking about here, in a way, is three things. We're talking about wholesale, we're talking about retail, and we're talking about content. There's three levels of integration here that affect the, what's being proposed as net neutrality. Um, basically, what we have is wholesale, we have the owners of the interstate fiber, the infrastructure, the means for how the traffic gets from one place to the other. These are the, the big companies, generally like AT&T and, and, well, whomever they've emerged as with all the mergers, but the large telcos that own the physical infrastructure, that in a sense we can consider wholesale. That's wholesale. Retail is what you at home as the subscriber gets. Then in the sense are those who provide applications and services over the web, the Googles, the Yahoos, the AOLs, et cetera, the content providers. All of these basically, we have a problem which is the wholesale sellers want to get into the content business. Getting into the content business, the vertical integration, they want to be able to prefer their services that they deliver over their own infrastructure to the subscriber. And to be able to exclude something that's originating from perhaps the subscriber end, or at the larger end, the wholesale purchaser end, the data centers, uh, where the Googles, the Yahoos, et cetera, buy their bandwidth. So in a sense, the market is, the large companies are, in fact, paying their bandwidth. It's not that Google gets a free ride because they have to pay to link in. And generally, where these places exist, there are uh, literally physical buildings. You know, anybody who thinks cyberspace is this ethereal, uh, a nebulous thing is deluded because, it, you know, guys with hard hats dig trenches and lay pipes, you know, in the ground. Retail is what we call in an in a, industry terms, the last mile. What the last mile is, in fact, is the first mile, which is the wholesale to the content provider, and then the last mile, which is the subscriber line. And the subscriber line, as, as uh, Kinsey very uh, adequately explained, is already tiered by its nature, because we have a dial-up service, we have a DSL, we have cable, and all of that is already inherent in the way the market has evolved over time, given the media and the physical means we had to deliver service. So the last mile is really where the net neutrality breaks down. Because at the wholesale end, at the content end, the Googles, the AOLs, et cetera, are already paying for their bandwidth. They are buying it. They have to send a certain amount of traffic. I still am missing understanding what would be the government law. Well, Can you give me an example of what this wants to do? to accomplish this uh, neutrality? When I was saying earlier about wholesale and retail and who pays, the wholesale, the guys who own the pipes, right, the first mile and the last mile, are getting paid from two ends. You understand? You pay when you pay your subscriber bill, and the data center folks, whoever those are, the content providers, also pay a lot. They already do. They do pay. And so when you get your last mile service through Verizon, you're paying them. They price it in such a way they can make a profit off of that. I don't believe that price should be regulated. Um, my question is, 
you may have gotten to this a little, but um, the internet originally was set up by some people. I don't know exactly who, government and private industry. The defense advanced research. Okay, but project. it doesn't matter. My point is, is that someone set up the the uh, first switching stations and someone laid out the cable al along the country and also the telephone companies had cable in cities and, com and counties. Now, didn't most of those people get a monopoly to lay out all those lines and those switches originally? And so since they got a monopoly, don't they have a responsibility uh, to they, don't they automatically have a net neutrality responsibility? Um, because no one else is allowed to just go around the country laying down fiber optic lines and go into cities. Like, I can't start my own cable company here. I can't start my own telephone company here. So I don't have a chance to even compete with them. Well, you can, actually, by resale. <laughs> but you can. really but I, can't, I can't lay you know my own how. lines. You don't have to. You, you can, that's what I was saying about wholesale and retail, and there's, a way, there's another way, like, as, as, for example, my structure is we buy bandwidth wholesale, and then we share that with our members. And that's a way that we can do it, and we distribute it over the air using unlicensed spectrum and, you know, free space optics and things like this. So there is a way, actually, you could do it. But I, I understand your point, and, and there, were, there are actually laws governing this. There are FCC regulations about uh, the uh, sharing of essential facilities. In fact, the reason that we have competitive uh, long distance now was because uh, AT&T was a once a, a publicly regulated monopoly. And, and in, in 1978, a small company called MCI, was a small startup back then, uh, was using microwave over the air. They bought licensed spectrum, but they were using microwave to link corporate networks. And then they developed a long distance service and they sued AT&T in 1978 uh, using the antitrust law. And this is another issue that may come into place, for example, uh, is antitrust. Because AT&T was the long distance and local monopoly. And they were refusing to allow to switch MCI's calls. So there were places in the country where MCI could not make, you couldn't make a long distance call over MCI in 1978. And so they sued AT&T using the, what's called the essential facilities doctrine. And that, that says that wherever there's a choke point, a bottleneck in the network, that the owner of that monopoly has to allow access to the competition on a non-discriminatory basis. And, and this law, they prevailed in 1982, and that caused the breakup of AT&T. And that breakup then caused the price to drop to the end user for long distance service. Similar uh, antitrust could apply to net neutrality in that last mile if that last mile is determined to be an essential facility. That argument needs to be tested in court. But I believe that any corporation who feels that their content is being discriminated to the subscriber has a cause for antitrust action. I'm not a lawyer, but I, I have experience in that realm because I, I filed a similar case uh, in the domain realm in 1997 against Network Solutions, which we used the essential facilities argument. In this case, uh, actually, this was to enter the domain registration market using top-level domains other than .com. So, for example, like .art or .politics. And uh, we asked for access to the root database of the domain name system uh, inclusion into the root database, uh, which is an essential facility and uh, which Network Solutions controlled. In the end, and this is one of the things that actually will illustrate my point, I ask that the laws that we have just be enforced fairly. And in our case, Network Solutions was given permission to break the law because what worked for MCI to break up AT&T in terms of the essential facility was protected in namespace versus network solutions where they got immunity from the antitrust laws and we were frozen out of the market. Well, my understanding is that the principal parts of this debate uh, relate less with the, the infrastructure or pricing of infrastructure, but discrimination of, of packets from the beginning Policy, to end. Policy, yes. And um, I guess that what I, my question is, how would net competition in that way, uh, foster, protect, or ensure uh, non-discrimination of packets? Or what benefits may arise from the discrimination of packets? 
Okay, that's a, that's a good question and there's a technical side to that and there's a policy side and they kind of mix in terms of the practical experience people get at the end of the day. Um, who owns the, the infrastructure sets the policy for what happens over that infrastructure. Generally, everyone agrees and the internet was able to evolve because everyone has agreed in the end-to-end -end principle not to discriminate general traffic, as long as it isn't abusive traffic. I guess that's yeah. the definition, right? Um, and so, as a, in, in my case, as an alternative last mile provider and as a, pri you know, defining ourselves also as a private network, we can set policies that we prefer not to have dictated by government, but to have uh, basically authored by our, our users in, in their interest. So, if we say our, our last mile is neutral, it is because that's just the way we, we configure it, our network and we allow things to flow equally, you know, even symmetrically. If you think about a home DSL line or a cable line, for example, the connection is asymmetrical. It favors download to upload. So you try to set up a server or something in your house and run it off of that, you're generally thwarted from that, you see? So the concept of neutrality really is defined by those who actually own the infrastructure. And uh, again, in our case, uh, since we have a stakeholder uh, membership, our members agree that we all want our network to be neutral. And so when we buy our wholesale connection upstream, it is because that's the wholesale agreement we have. And then we extend that all the way to the subscriber, probably unlike any others. And really, I mean, we believe that competition is the best policy and we'd rather have it regulated by the free market rather than the government. It doesn't make sense to have the government dipping their noses into the into this business. So does this make any sense to anyone? It's a really complicated issue and I've been explaining it over months and months and months and oftentimes people's eyes just glaze over. <laughs> let's, let's go over here for a second. If these laws are, are go through, I don't know where they are at in Congress. Do you know where they're at in Congress? Well, there's, right now net neutrality is zero for six, I think in terms of federal uh, regulation. Uh, the Snow Dorgan bill was introduced last year. It died in the Senate Commerce Committee. Uh, they're threatening to reintroduce it this year. Uh, there's also a few, there's a Supreme Court case that's, uh, I think it's the Blacken case, uh, that basically in 2005 said that this is not okay. We can't, this is, not, we should not regulate this. This is not part of what the government should be doing. Uh, so right now, they're failing on all levels. <laughs> Right, it but, but there seems to be too. significant support for it despite the fact it's failed it, because that's why we're here anyway, because it could change. Right. A different and president, a different Congress. This is and very true. And I think the, the sort of why we're here is not necessarily, I mean, we believe that it's fine the way it is. Right now there is no government regulation on this. Uh, what they want to do is introduce government regulation. And the, the other side, as I was saying, is very heavy handed on it. They're the ones that are making an issue of this. They're the ones that want to regulate it. So they're the ones that are pouring tons of money into it. It's groups like like Google, Move On, the, actually the Christian Coalition joined as well. At one point. Why do they want to do this? Why do so many groups are are so? Uh, why do they want to introduce these legislations? What do they think they're losing by not having this legislation? They think that the way that it is now, that there will be essentially what they refer to as toll roads. On the internet. And there already are. There already are toll roads. I mean, you know, you basically, the amount of bandwidth that you get is what you pay for, no matter what. And that happens upstream at the wholesale level and downstream at the subscriber so you, level. I mean, if, you, if you've ever tried downloading a TV show, if, I mean, depending upon your service and depending upon the, the wholesaler, essentially, it could be really fast or it could be really slow. And what, you know, with the free market, if you're, you're a site, if you're the wholesaler, and you want your, your TV show to be downloaded faster, then you would be, pay more because it's faster. And you want customers to look at your site as opposed to somebody else who might be you know, allowing to download the same show. Right, so the content people could pay, wind up paying more under free competition, but the person at the other end should pay the same 1999 or whatever. Right, they pay. essentially, I mean, this is, you may disagree with me, but essentially my understanding of it is that we aren't, we as customers are not really uh, we'll be affected by it, but our prices probably won't jump. Because they would jump only because there wouldn't be any more competition. But that's that's why basically we don't. Think or or you wouldn't be able to get a a, a content neutral connection. The adult entertainment industry, as it is sometimes euphemistically referred to, is responsible for a tremendous chunk of the bandwidth usage in the internet. 
And I was wondering if either side in the argument had played the porno card in terms of introducing regulation for net neutrality. In, in terms of what? In terms of having access to that? Well, that's what I was just talking about, the content providers. It doesn't matter what the nature of the content is. It, all, all such digital television is essentially what we're arguing. Phone, voice over IP, and digital phone. That's really the controversy because the cable companies and the phone companies, basically broadband is where those two things merge. And internet, what we knew as in, you know, web, which is basically now it's all the same thing. So uh, it doesn't matter what the content is. It, it, it's, it's just the same, the same argument as MCI's long distance call switched over the other guy's network, that there should be a non-discriminatory access. In a sense, it's an antitrust issue, and if, if the end users are blocked from getting content from any content providers when they're paying for their line, when you pay for that internet connection, you expect anything that works over the internet to come over that as long as you pay as much speed as you pay for you want that, no matter where the heck it's coming from, you want it, right? That's what you get your internet connection for, right? So unlike search filters and libraries, nobody's puritanical morality has played into the structure of the net neutrality proposals at all? I don't think that it, personally, I don't think that, that it, it's come up in that sense. It's much more about the vertical integration of content and infrastructure, you know? The, the trying to force the, broadband into the cable TV model system. In the simple case of the legislation, I would end up in New York City paying some increased fee, for example, to Verizon. Probably, I mean, right? Is that roughly what the legislation would accomplish? Essentially, because there's no right. competition. Verizon would then, well, because of that increased price, nobody else would be able to come in and offer me. I wouldn't have the choice. Well, you, I mean, you do have a choice being in New York because New York is great, but you do have a choice. If you wanted Time Warner, you could have Time Warner. But it would be at the same increased price, it's legislated by this new proposed legislation. Well, and yes, and what the right. legislation... So this is bad right. for, for everybody. everybody. I do have some sympathy. You mentioned this last mile and trying to get fiber there. Right, I mean, given your arrival to that thought, this would enable them to, should, not necessarily that they'd spend the money that way, but it would arguably give them the money to, to enable a better last mile. Well, I don't really think that's, it's kind of a funny question in a way because they're doing this already. This is what the Fios is. Okay. And, okay. and in fact, that's their capital investment. That's up to their shareholders to do. This is, this is also the same reason, for example, I disagree with Con Ed's request for a rate hike to fix what they screwed up in Queens. You know, that's their shareholders' responsibility. That's their capital Can fund. I ask they you, should pay that. Uh, thank you. Can I ask you something else, though, too? If they did this, what I imagine, if, if you know, is even though the Chinese government does everything possible to filter out. Once somebody manages to get to the web, anywhere, even if, even if it were over this Verizon distorted thing, they wouldn't be able to stop you from going wherever you want to go. Sure they can. I'm sorry? Yes, they can. Because that last mile is not necessarily neutral. That last mile, in fact, what you already get from Verizon, and, and I, in fact, a friend of mine has a, a, a resale over Time Warner through Earthlink. You know, Earthlink, when you buy Earthlink account, basically you're buying it over Time Warner because they own the line. And, I, when she, and they were telling me, God, there's certain websites we just can't reach already. And when I was uh, doing some work on, on a computer uh, for them at, at their place, we went to try, I said, show me some of these sites you can't reach. And uh, when I tested it, and then I went into a, a terminal and, and did a test, the sites, they were blocking the domain resolution of the sites. They were redirecting it somewhere else, and this is not usual. So there is an example, and for whatever reason, arbitrarily, or I don't even know, they never gave a reason why, they are actually blocking access. And in fact, if you have a cable uh, account or whatever, you can't put a web server and have port 80 open, or port 25 for email, for email SMTP uh, service, because it's blocked. So you're already not getting a neutral connection. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think you brought up a good point too, though, is that the the, the major companies, Verizon, AT&T, they actually do have to lay the cable. They have to dig up the street. They have to pay the, the 
the union guys, which is expensive in New York because they work in so many hours and they take a break. Anyway. So that's, I mean, this is what they're selling. This is their product, is the cable that they're laying in the street. So, and that's, ex it's not cheap to do it. But it's also, it's also possible, like I said, though, to use other unlicensed technologies. There's laser optics, there's, there's unlicensed spectrum to deliver fiber-like speeds, uh, fiber equivalent speeds, not fiber-like. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, we'll probably take about two more questions. We will adjourn to the bar over here in the corner after the meeting to uh, continue de the debate in a somewhat more lubricated fashion. Uh, please fill out feedback forms if you're interested in making comments or getting back in touch with us. Um, maybe two more questions? Isn't it true that, um, you know, you talk about that it's unregulated, there's a free market, but that might not be completely true since uh, throughout most of the country, I think a lot of these companies like Verizon or Quest or whoever are, get very, very cozy with the local governments that give only one right of way to any one company to come through their town. And they won't allow any other rival cable or phone companies to come through, and that kind of stifles the competition. Well, I think, I mean, that's, you're getting into sort of the cable franchising issue. Uh, which has been debated as well, not nearly as hotly as net neutrality, but it's also debated. But there is, I mean, that, that's, where you, that's where the sort of, I guess, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that there is, a, there is competition still. The companies are still fighting for sort of the local government support. There's, uh, and you can also enter into it. Most, I mean, most local governments will look at several different companies and get the best deal for their town. Uh, for example, uh, if you are uh, cable vision and you want to lay cable in, in Staten Island, uh, you have to go through the New York City Council to do that. <sighs> and the New York City Council actually is very even-handed about this, and they think that everyone should be able to. There are other places on Long Island, for example, where only one company is coming in, uh, and that's because the mayor made a deal with the company for the best the best deal, and they usually get a lot of perks, like company uh, or you know, community gifts, essentially. Some years ago, I was involved with pirate radio, and some people pirate television. Would it be possible to run um, pirate uh, internet operations? Well, you don't have to, because we have uh, we don't have to have a spectrum license to broadcast the data over the air now because we have an unlicensed spectrum like Wi-Fi, WiMAX, things like that that are already available. So in a sense, the romance of doing pirate radio is, is kind of cool, but it's not relevant anymore. You don't have to be a pirate. Uh, everyone is getting their check. I just want to let you know if you're going to pay by credit card, please tell the server in advance what your tip is. Otherwise, they can't, you can't give them the tip after they bring you the check. Thanks a lot.